Hey, this is Denny Hanlon, and you're watching Cup Connection. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Massaro, and thank you for joining us here on Cup Connection. Two races into the season, and some storylines are beginning to develop, and they'll continue to percolate this weekend as the action resumes in Las Vegas. Now, atop the list, well, that has to be Kyle Busch. It didn't take long for him to prove he could win with RCR. Last Sunday, he picked up his 61st career win and first with his new organization. Now, a lot of that victory came down to Kyle's final pit stop. Coming up, we'll hear from his pit crew coach about what that money stop was like and why it was so important for those guys who go over the wall. Ross Chastain also made a statement in California. After leading a race-high 91 laps, he has emerged as the point leader, proving to some that last year was no fluke. Just ahead, hear what one of NASCAR's most insightful reporters has to say about Chastain, Bush, and others heading into race three. To help us break it all down, let's check in with one of the most intrepid reporters in all of NASCAR. Joining us now is the incomparable Bob Pachris, who is regarded perhaps as the best reporter in the NASCAR business. Bob, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Mike. Hey, so much ground to cover here, Bob, as you're already in Vegas. I know you're busy, but I want to kind of turn the clock back to a week ago in Fontana. Kyle Busch getting to victory lane. One thing I just, I just was curious to get your thoughts on. We heard so much about people saying people doubted Kyle. They didn't know if he could get back to victory lane with RCR. I want to know who these doubters are. Who, who <laughs> doubted Kyle Bush? <laughs> you did. Maybe, maybe a little. Well, I, I think the, the question wasn't whether he would win with RCR. The question was when would he win with RCR? And I don't think that many of us thought it would be in the first few weeks. And and not just that he won at Fontana, but the fact is, is that he challenged for the win at the clash he was leading in his duel before he got wrecked he was leading in he led at lap 500 or mile 500 of the daytona 500 so i think that consistency of strength that he has shown in his you know opening weeks at rcr is is, is just so impressive because you haven't seen that out of rcr cars week in and week out and Bob, you follow sports. You, you know when people say things that uh, may get under your skin, they become what they call bulletin board material. As if Kyle Busch needed any more motivation. I mean, you give him bulletin board material, how dangerous can he be on that race? <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, a motivated Kyle Busch is a dangerous Kyle Busch, right? And the thing is, like, he's always motivated to win. But, you know, I think, when you know, the fact that things didn't work out at Gibbs, uh, they couldn't come to an agreement as far as you know, salary that Kyle wanted, and the fact that he ended up going somewhere else, you know, obviously, you know, irked him. It, it, it was, you know, I think he wanted to stay at Gibbs. He wanted to continue to drive for that organization. But when they pretty much uh, left the table and said, "Okay, we're going to bring Ty Gibbs up. You're free to go," you know, that was that was probably a little bit of a punch in the gut for for Kyle Busch and. You know, and he found a place where he could go, a place where that was maybe a little bit unproven. I mean, granted, that team won three races, the eight car last year, but still, you know, it was it it it, it, it RCR certainly hasn't had the swagger that JGR has had over the last decade. Not recently, no, no, that's for sure. But it seems like it might be back now as they go to Las Vegas, uh, a racetrack where we all know Kyle wants to perform at a very high level. After all, that's his hometown. What do you expect out of him this weekend? <laughs> I expect Kyle Busch to, he's got to run three races, trucks, Finney and Cup, and I expect him to challenge for the wins each uh, each time. I, I don't know whether he will win, but I do find it interesting that uh, that you know, John Hunter Nemechek is, is in a truck for Toyota. Tyler Reddick is in a uh, is an Xfinity car for Toyota. I think that there's going to be a little bit of a, <laughs> we'll, we'll put past a little Toyota-Kyle Busch rivalry uh rearing up uh, this weekend in Vegas. That's a great point. Something to watch for. Uh, no question. Thanks for pointing that out, Bob. <laughs> All right. So I want to I want to talk about somebody else. I want to talk about Ross Chastain. Now, last year, obviously, a breakout season for Ross, but he's come out of the box really strong once again this year. How important do you think it was for him to, to kind of prove that last year wasn't a fluke? 
I think it was important. I think it was important for that whole organization and not just Ross, but Daniel Suarez has been running well too. So that organization looks like they haven't missed a beat. And, and that was really important uh, for for them and probably continues to be important for them through through Coda. And, and you know, where, where, where Ross won is uh, – where Ross won his first race, right? So I think if they continue to prove that that they are a team to that that you're gonna have to you know beat in order to win races, you know that they, they're gonna be they're gonna be strong. And you know, as you know, in this sport, it's it's never easy to get too close to the top or at the top, but it's even harder to stay there. Yeah, uh, maintaining that. I mean, there's certain organizations that have been able to do that. You know, teams like Hendrick and. Uh, of course, Penske and Joe Gibbs Racing and so many others. Uh, but this is Trackhouse Racing, you know, a, a team that's relatively new to the sport. When I say relatively, they're not exactly new. Uh, and they've got some alliances. How important are those alliances to, to giving them those fast race cars that they've had so far this year? Uh, I think they're important. Uh, I think really when you look at track house, you have Darian Grubb, who a veteran of Hendrick Motorsports and the Jimmy Johnson era championships. He's over there running the technical side. He's very well versed in what's going on, very well versed in uh, what, what Chevrolet is doing. And I think that is a huge key. And then I just think that they they have confidence and they have they have trust. And I think that 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 goes a long way. If you can trust your crew chief to make the changes off of your feedback. And if your crew chief trusts the driver to, you know, race as hard as he can and not say, well, we need to do this, but instead take what's given to him and do the best with it. I think that goes a long, long way. And that's what I see in track house. Yeah. Lots of great chemistry. Uh, there's no question about that. So uh, moving on a little bit, I'm sure there's some lingering stories from Fontana that may carry over to Las Vegas. And one of them that I think is probably going to be talked about is uh, what happened on the restart that, that uh, kind of swallowed up so many cars in Fontana. I know you talked to a lot of drivers after that. What are they saying about restarts right now? <laughs> well, they, they say there, there shouldn't be games on restarts. Of course, those are probably the ones not playing <laughs> the games, right? Like it's like everybody does it when you're in position or at least some do. And it, and so the question is whether NASCAR is going to have to get involved. Joey Logano, the leader at that restart, said he didn't do anything wrong, that he pretty much just accelerated late in the zone. And he accelerated late in the zone because the driver beside him, Ross Chastain, was laying back, trying to get a good bit of momentum on the start and trying to ju judge when Joey would hit the gas and in order for him to kind of hit the gas at the same time and hopefully be able to to keep uh, to, to put Joey behind him. So. That's what that that's going to be the question for NASCAR. Do they start penalizing drivers for laying back to trying to get some momentum uh, there on the restart, and or are they just going to let them keep wrecking and eventually? <laughs> I don't think so. You know, eventually that that should drivers say, "Well, I don't want to wreck." I think the issue is is are the drivers who are kind of who are who are laying back up near closer to the front are they the ones who end up getting involved in the wreck? And sometimes yes, and sometimes no. What's the sense you're getting from NASCAR that they might do something? Well, I think they wanted, so they lengthened the restart zone uh, by 50%, 25% each way. And they said they do that for the first four or five weeks and then reevaluate it. So I think when, as they, as they evaluate things over the next few weeks, um, they, uh, they, you know, they, I think they'll come to a conclusion. And quite frankly, I, if in typical NASCAR fashion, I don't expect them to say anything until they blow the whistle, right? Until they come over the radio and say, "Hey, you, you're going to, you've got to do a pass through penalty because you didn't restart properly." Uh, they they don't typically tip their hand and say, "Hey, we're going to call it." Uh, they're just they're going to. People know the rules, and they know that when they kind of push the rules to a certain limit, NASCAR is going to react. And the the question is, when will NASCAR react? But they're going to find that limit. They, they're going to go all the way to the edge. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean that you, you've got to. It's early, especially early in the year. You know, if you get past, you, you know, what, what what's what? How much of a penalty is a pass through penalty worth, especially at a certain point in a race? All right. Speaking of penalties, uh, a loose wheel or a wheel that actually got away from Martin Truex is going to cost that team two crew members for the next two races, right? Mm -hmm. um, man, that penalty is harsh. How's that team going to to fill the void? Well, they're going to fill the void by 
uh, Gibbs leases uh, their backup crew members to other teams. And one of those teams is actually the 42 <laughs> of Legacy Motor Club, even though it's not a Toyota team. So they're going to get uh, a tire changer from uh, Noah Gregson's car. And then they're going to use uh, as a, a backup Jackman who is on Travis Pastrana's car for the Daytona 500. And, and they're going to be on the 19 car at Truex. So yeah, two, two weeks without two crew members. Now, you know, if this was a year ago, it'd be four weeks without those two crew members, as well as the car, as well as the crew chief. NASCAR decided to kind of, you know, make the penalty a little bit less harsh. And now if, if the wheel comes off actually on pit road, it's just a pass through or just a go to start, restart the tail of the longest line under yellow. Well, it still seems like a, a pretty stiff penalty and uh, one that teams will have to overcome. Uh, all right. So uh, as we wind down this interview, Bob, what are you watching out for this weekend? Well, we're in Vegas, so definitely, as you mentioned, we're going to watch Kyle Busch. We're going to watch the restarts. Uh, I want to watch, you know, Joey Logano won here in the fall, kind of sparked his his you know championship run last uh, last fall. So I expect him to be good. And you know, and again, I'll go back to Kyle Busch because Kyle Busch spun in the spring race here, and he spun in the fall race here. And he still finished top five in both races. So if he has a clean day and doesn't spin, that's probably bad news for the competition. Another example why you should never, ever doubt Kyle Busch, Bob. Don't doubt him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't doubt him, but, you know, hey, you got to. I mean, we've all seen athletes change teams and some are good and some are bad. Uh, but, um, yeah, here, uh, here uh, I guess for lack of a better term, they, uh, they wasted no time. Yeah, uh, they didn't have to look at any watches to determine when they were going to be good. They, they they were good right off the bat. Yeah, and I expect they'll be good for quite some time. Thank you, Bob. We appreciate you joining us. Look forward to having you on again sometime before the end of the year. Thank you, Mike. Now, quite honestly, there is no harder working member of the NASCAR Media Corps than Bob Pachris. He is simply one of the sports treasures. And as you heard Bob discuss, Kyle Busch is doing what Kyle Busch does. He continues to win. With his Fontana victory, Kyle became the first driver in NASCAR Cup Series history to win a race in 19 consecutive seasons. That breaks a tie he had with the King, Richard Petty. And my suspicion is that streak could go on beyond this year. A big part of last week's win was the sensational work on pit road, including a flawless final stop, beating Ross Chastain off pit road. That was critical in achieving victory. Joining us now is the pit crew coach for the number eight team of Richard Childress Racing. That will be Ray Wright. Hey, Ray, congratulations on the big win this past weekend, and thanks for joining us. Hey, man, thank you, and uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. A absolutely. You know, I think you and your entire team deserve a lot of credit. I mean, it, this race could have gone either way between Kyle or Ross Chastain. It was that last pit stop, though, that, that green flag pit stop with uh, just over 30 laps to go. Knowing that the victory kind of weighed in the balance, what were your thoughts as Kyle came to your crew? To be honest, man, since, you know, we uh, announced, I forget what month last year we announced Kyle was coming over. But, you know, there's there's definitely been a a, a burden, you know, to because he's always had a great pit crew. And, uh, you know, we have a great three pit crew here they're they're amongst the top on pit road every week and uh you know had to put together a team this year and the guys we've been working hard all off season and uh you know kyle bush is going to do everything right on pit road he's the best on pit road he's the best in the box he's the best out of the box he's the best off pit road i mean every week i used to look at those numbers last year and see him in the 18 car you know in the top in the top tier so you know he's going to do everything and that puts our guys in a good position there's so many variables uh for a pit stop and driver in the box stopping on the mark getting out uh really helps the pit crew and uh so you knew he was going to do his job we just got to do our job and uh you know talking about those variables you just never know how it's going to go you know you never know you can have a you can have a great day on pit road up until the last stop you can have a terrible first stop of the day and then have be solid the rest of the day. So just proud of the guys. Uh, they want to pit the eight car. They want to uh, pit for Kyle Busch. We all know what he's capable of doing. And I'm just glad that they had an opportunity so early in the season to gain that confidence, to see themselves um, 
excel in that in that position because that you're right that was a big big pit stop you know it's interesting you use the word burden and, and i assume you mean because you wanted to live up to the standards that, that yeah. Kyle was used to so yeah. that had to be kind of a pressure filled stop right there that that was the moment of truth <laughs> yeah uh it was i think we started 21st and you watch the scoring pile on a fontana man and you just see him going straight up the scoring pile on and you knew it was going to be a big day on pit road and uh, yeah, burden might not. Be, you know, it was it was stressful, right? You wanna you want to uh, you want to step up. You want your your department, your pit department, to step up, and you don't want to be a reason why we finish second or third. You know. So uh, new team. You talked about that. Kind of some new pieces and parts, if you will. What's it taken this year to get to the point where they could be a winner in race two? Um. A lot of hard work. Uh, we uh, that sounds cliche, but that's really what it is. And and you get you can do all the pit do all the work in pit stop practice you want. You know, uh, you can. It's like batting practice. You know, you can hit fastball after fastball. But man, it was such a blessing. Like I said earlier, to have to for these guys to see themselves um, achieve uh, early in the season. Man, I think it does because. All this is is about uh, seeing yourself perform in your performance. And, and that's that's the best kind of confidence that you can gain is actually being put in a fire and achieving your goals, hitting your marks, coming up with a very good competitive pit stop in a clutch situation. So that's worth a million practices compared to what we've done in the offseason. So it's just good that it happened the second race of the season. So, Ray, I love the fact that you use the baseball analogy. I know you're a big baseball guy, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so years ago, decades ago, really, you think back to the Rainbow Warriors and, and Ray Everham. I, I think he really started the movement where uh, teams were going after athletes outside of the sport, trying to find stronger, faster people to pit the cars. Yeah. Turn the clock ahead a couple of decades. Where's that right now? Same spot, man, really. And, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, uh, we just uh, we you just need tough minded individuals. You know, you need very uh, disciplined, tough mind. Like I said, if, if the stop before that stop that you mentioned would have been a disaster, we need guys who are going to flush it, not worry about it and uh, and perform like our Jackman on that car. He's a he's an old hockey player, but um, that guy is one of the most mentally tough people on pit road. He he will attack the car and uh, he could screw up seven times before that in a race. But and he's still going to go wide open. He's still going to go hard and he's still going to try to put out the fastest stop he can. That's the kind of people I'm looking for. I don't care if you, uh, you know, you played a, a former sport, you're ex-military, you ride unicorns. I don't care if you're a tough minded individual, you're an athlete, you want to compete, then, man, come to RCR and pit a race car. Yeah, can't beat yourself, that's for sure. That's right. Uh, so I, the other variable, of course, uh, is the the new car. I, I don't know if I should call it a new car. It's in second year. It changed a lot of things last year. Have you completely adapted to it? <laughs> uh, I'd like to hear the other pit crew coaches answer that question. I'm going <laughs> to say no. I, I think there's still a lot of stuff that we don't know. I tell you what, we're in a way better position than we were last Fontana. Uh, you know, I mean, you can still have a wheel come off um, easily. We saw that kind of, you know, with a very good pit crew last week. Uh, but we're just trying to go so fast. I mean, people – I mean, there are some eight-second pit stops this week in Fontana. Last year uh, in that Fontana race, you had about a 1080, 1090 was a really fast pit stop. And now an eight, we got an 890 one year later. So we're trying to go as fast as we can. If that lug nut does not catch those threads, it's gonna the wheel's gonna come off, and that can happen so easily. And there's a vast array of possibilities that can make that wheel come off. So I feel like we're definitely in a better position, but I still feel you know there there's still some things that happen uh, that we just can't put a finger on right now. You know, like what? Uh, for example, we couldn't get a, uh, and I think I saw other people have this issue uh the car's off the ground we're trying to pull the wheel off and uh you know it won't come off you know you got to say you got to pull it a couple times that's a that's a pit stop killer and uh mm -hmm. and man looking at the helmet cam we don't know 
<laughs> you know, right. it wasn't the wheel openings were clear, the cars off the ground. You know, usually you can chalk it up to maybe the jack went up all the way. Uh, maybe the droop, you know, he, he got the lug nut off really fast. So, uh, you know, maybe we caught some wheel opening. No, none of that. So, you know, just stuff like that, like that stuff like that never happened in the five leg, you know? Uh, so, you know, that, that's just one. <laughs> it's never easy. Hey, before we go, Ray, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about a charitable effort you're behind pit stops for hope. What's that all about? So pit stops for hope started in 2013, right here. We started right here at RCR, uh, found out that North Carolina has this, the second highest uh, food shortage amongst kids. We have the most food insecure kids in the country. And uh, so that's just terrible, man. There shouldn't be one kid living in America uh, that should go to school hungry. And we have unbelievable numbers of kids, not only in North Carolina, but all over the country that go to school. Uh, unfortunately, primarily to get breakfast and to get lunch. And uh, so we donate to Second Harvest Food Bank, Salvation Army. And the more we work with them, the more we kind of get kicked into schools uh, to help just, you know, to help the teachers put food in the backpacks of kids. Well, there's it's a big problem, Mike. So you got hungry kids going to school then you have schools after you talk to the teachers to help them put food in their backpacks they're also putting school supplies in their backpacks uh you ask a teacher what's the budget for that and they laugh at you <laughs> there's not a budget for that the teachers got to pay for it and the teachers god bless them they do a great job they just don't make uh, a lot of money to be able to support their kids at their house and then the kids in their classroom so you've got poorly funded schools Schools, you got hungry kids. Unfortunately, our society is propelling this cycle of poverty. It's making it really hard. All kids, all we're trying to do is help kids get a real opportunity. You can't, you can't do stuff for for people. You can't make them succeed, but you can give them an opportunity. So feed them, help their brains develop, put them in a classroom that's properly funded with proper uh, learning materials and give them an opportunity to succeed for themselves. Uh, we help with the food. We're putting reading centers in every state. We've got 26 states uh, completed. We're putting a reading center in each state. After we're done with the 50, we're gonna circle back around, then we're gonna circle back around. And uh, we're gonna, we're a very small charity. There's not one full-time employee. Uh, we do it, we try to help out. We try to raise money whenever we can. We do it on shows like yours, social media. And, uh, man, we feel like I'm not put on this earth to be a pit crew coach. You know, I think we're here to help other people. <laughs> and so that's what we're trying to do. Well, I, I applaud the efforts, Ray, for sure. You, you make a good point. It's certainly a need throughout the entire country. So yeah. uh, thank you for doing your part. And we also wish you uh, the best of luck in Las Vegas, not only on the racetrack, but of course, you may be away from it. You might need some luck there, too. So uh, yeah. thanks again, Ray. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, man. See y'all. Ray Wright is a big man with a big heart. And as you heard Ray say, it takes mental toughness to be successful in this sport. And to that end, there are some drivers who need to forget about the first couple of races and start picking up the pieces. That includes Tyler Reddick. He's been swallowed up in crashes in the opening races and now finds himself 38th in the standings. Reddick needs to forget about that, though, and focus on Vegas where in the most recent race there, he sat on the pole and led 32 laps. Of course, that was with a different team. Another guy in a hole looking to dig his way out is Ryan Priest. He's 34th in the standings after also crashing in the first two races. What bodes well for Priest, though, is that he's with a very solid Stuart Haas team that usually brings fast race cars to Vegas. Stuart Haas has won there three times since 2012. And two of those victories were scored by Kevin Harvick, who should again be among the contenders. Joey Logano is also expected to be strong. He's one of the best there. A three-time Vegas winner whose average finish is the best among active drivers. Meanwhile, Brad Keselowski also has three Vegas wins and he has shown signs of getting closer to breaking through and getting that first victory with RFK Racing. And of course, there's the two Kyles. Kyle Larson is definitely due for a victory. And Kyle Busch, as we've documented, is a Vegas native and carries momentum to his home track. There's some food for thought as you enter the race weekend. 
Thanks for watching. Tough Connection.